All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement uh, Lecture Series. Uh, thanks uh, for all of you uh, for joining. And we have a guest uh, lecturer today, uh, Stephen Savage, who is an Agile Program Manager uh, in the Stanford University Technology and Digital Solutions Department. He is a Scrum Master, a Project Manager, and a Program Manager focused on delivering both projects and organizational improvements. He has 26 years of experience in IT, uh, 10 as a programmer and 16 as a uh, pro, uh, project manager and program manager. And um, we look forward to hearing his comments today. Uh, Steve, thanks again so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. So first of all, let me just uh, give you an idea of where this all comes from. Uh, first of all, I wanna mention, say thanks to everyone coming. For those of you new here, this is a crossover event. It's not just SMCI, we've got people invited from the Agile Community of Practice, UIT, and TDS. So this is a chance to get to know each other. Uh, I am part of a group in TDS called Agile Growth. It's a team in the PMO that focuses on Agile coaching, guidance, process analysis, and improvement. And this presentation would not be possible without the team I work with. That includes Brendan, our events expert and coach, Mike, who does materials, Anil, our standards person, Carolyn, our infrastructure expert, and Richard, who is our expert with finance and is doing his own agile transformation. So this would not be possible without the team, and I really appreciate this. And so, you know, this is gonna be a little long. So what we're doing is I'm gonna pause for questions and then we can have some at the end. But this is designed to be something where people ask questions, so it's participatory. And we're going to dive right into it. So simply put, let's have an introduction to Agile. Now, I know some of you have heard of Agile, some of you haven't, some of you have done it, and some of you are leery of it. We're going to get to know Agile by meeting an imaginary team, Project APIS. Project APIS is a web-based app to connect students, mentors, and projects for medical research and education. It's designed to be rapid development and have mobile components. It mixes old and new technology and its current status on fire and we're arguing with each other, or what we call red, but we're really saying it's yellow on the status report. So let's get to know the people in Project APIS and we'll walk you through this imaginary process and see Agile being implemented. We have Ruth, the analyst. Ruth determines what user needs are, but people change their minds. The requirements are confusing and no one wants to say what the problems are. Sai, the project manager, he's planning the projects, but everything is off. He hates status reports and there's too many unknowns. And by the way, everyone, if you could mute your phones, occasionally I'm hearing some feedback. Kel, the lead programmer is solving problems. They're working overtime. Things aren't getting done. The requirements aren't what people say they are. And you do not want to hear or describe the technology. So let's take a look at this team and talk about Agile and how it helps them. And feel free to interrupt me with any questions. You can put it in chat or just butt in verbally if you like. Agile, as you've probably heard of, you've probably heard of Agile, you've heard Scrum, you've heard about Agile projects. Agile is best visualized as kind of a philosophy of projects on how they should be run and methods you can use to run projects that way. And Agile is people focused. Agile is about a project where people know their job. We accept that everyone in a project has useful perspectives, that most problems aren't due to people. It's that we need to support each other. And if you run a project where your first thought is, how do people get involved? How do we focus on what people know on the end user, on the experts on our team? That's Agile. Agile is focusing on people. And that fits our thesis here. By empowering people with Agile, we get adaptable teams. Some of you may have seen this, the Agile Manifesto. In fact, some of you might be tired of hearing about it. It's online at agilemanifesto.org. The website hasn't been updated in a while, and it was formed in 2001 when a variety of software development experts came together to turn their practices 
into a philosophy and an approach. And the ideal project in Agile is focusing on individuals and interactions over process and tools, getting people to talk to each other and asking what people need. You focus on delivering working software or whatever first. It's better to have something that works than document everything. You get feedback and you can use whatever you've produced literally as its own documentation. You focus on collaboration over contract negotiation. You avoid an adversarial approach. And you respond to change over following a plan. Tools, a plan, all that is valuable. But the things on the left, that's what you care about in an agile approach to projects. And it's quite a shift. But it's really about being where you are. Agile means that you take a transparent and honest approach. You admit what's going on, you talk and negotiate, you adapt and you deliver in small chunks to learn. You accept where you are. And that's why it's important to realize that Agile is a very people-centric approach. And that's also why people use it to solve problems. Sometimes our biggest problems is we just don't involve people. So we have a first poll here. We talked about the strengths in Agile and I'd like to kind of hear, um, hear what yours are. Uh, actually, I see that this is a one single poll, Selena. Okay, I'll fix it. All right, oh, that's okay. We can run it at the end. So I just want you to okay. think, I just want you to think for a moment, what's your strength in Agile? If you decided to use Agile approaches, what are you good at here? In fact, I'd like to hear from some, I'd like to pick one person in the audience to talk about their strength. Anyone here want to brag a bit? Unmute your phone and tell me. Otherwise, I'm going to call on somebody. Hey, Steve, this is Shamshad. Hey, Shamshad, what's your strength here? Responding to change. Okay. And how's that helped your projects? Um, quite a few times, because as soon as we get close to delivery, the customers look at what we are, what they see and say, oh, we need this and that, because that's where their bulbs go up and you know they get new ideas, which most of the time I feel is going to be very useful for the end result, uh, while they may be in fact to our technical team. Uh, so there is generally an uptick in the amount of effort, but I think they're just generally worth, um, worth it, good use, of, uh, good use for the customer. And, that, and that's customer focus. That's a big part of Agile. But we have our imaginary team. Imagine Team Apis here is informed about Agile. And they give their feedback. Ruth, the analyst, she likes to focus on change, but she wonders, how do you keep people from arguing? How do you stop the fighting? Sai, the project manager, loves the idea of people talking more, but how does it make a plan? And Kel, the lean programmer, she's heard it all before. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. With these three people dealing with the project on fire, let's get a little bit more about how Agile works. As I said, Agile is a philosophy. It's how a project should run iteratively, solutions evolving by collaboration, not necessarily having a full plan, but that's just theory. You bring it about with what are called Agile methods. They are techniques that you've probably all heard of, Scrum, Kanban, extreme programming. They are ways to embody the philosophy of Agile, a people-oriented, solutions-based, communicative approach. And there are a lot of them. We've all heard about these. And even those of us that practice Agile, there's at least one method we're tired of someone trying to sell us on. There's Scrum, which is iterative and has clear roles, Kanban, which is constant work, the prescriptive approach of dis disciplined agile development or the maximization focused extreme programming. And there's more. But fortunately, Sai here, who will read anything if you tell him, has already read up on it, decided he wants to use the Scrum methodology and already talked to the team. So let's take a look at one agile method to see how it works. And before I go on, would it, does anyone have any questions? Actually, there's a question in the chat. Oh, I missed that. Thank you, Brendan. You know, is SHC moving to Agile? No one's told me that, but Agile is something that I'm on a team that's advocating for. And 
If you want to know more about Agile, uh, you can ask me and my team. But it's really more Agile's a toolkit to use for your projects. This is Sabrina. We're we're already in a vertical that's using Agile under oh, Ideas Group. Yeah, I'd love to hear more after this. Sure. So beyond the fact that, uh, and Sabrina, if you have anything, be sure to add it too, because you have that direct hands-on knowledge. And can I ask, what method do you use? We use Scrum for two of our projects and Kanban for the third. Oh, interesting. Well, then you may have some thoughts on this because let's take a look at one Agile method, everyone. We're gonna look at Scrum. And Scrum is the one you always hear about, to be honest, but there's a reason for that. Scrum's an Agile method and it's, here's how it works. The team is very distinct. You have a product owner to know the product, the scrum master that's the coach and the guide, kind of a mixture of a project manager and an improvement person, and then the team. You have a backlog, the product owner owns that. They're small discrete pieces of work we call stories, and they're ranked in order of importance. Nothing can be of equal importance. It's literally a list of what you wanna do in order of how much it matters and what value it delivers. And the product owner constantly grooms it. They're always getting feedback, always adjusting. The work cycle is in what are called sprints, short periods of time where the team decides what they're going to work on. And they focus on that work and that work alone just for that period of time, usually about two weeks. The sprints are almost micro projects. But when they finish up their two weeks of work, they demonstrate, they evaluate, and they get feedback. So as I often like to put it, there's only so many mistakes you can make in two weeks, and then you get to learn from them. And Scrum uses a lot of events. There's a planning session every sprint. Every day, the team does a stand-up and touches base with each other. At the end, you have a demonstration of the work. You have a retrospective on the work. And you plan, and you do it all over again. It's summed up in this great diagram, which I've been using a lot, that simply the product owner filters the work into the backlog, grooms the stories, ranks them. The team selects what work they can do and as much as they think they can commit to at the planning meetings. They break the work down even further. They give feedback. They might reject the story as not being clear enough. The product owner makes things clear and ordered. The team figures what they can do. Then they have a sprint backlog and they go into their sprint. They start doing their work and the scrum master coaches them, resolves problems, runs burn down charts and other methods of tracking work. And every 24 hour, the team meets, it's for them. And the classic scrum method is you stand up and say what we did, what we're gonna do and what we need help with. Everyone knows what you did in the team. Everyone knows what's next. Everyone knows if you need help. And then you get back to work. I'm sure we would all love to have meetings that are 15 minutes or less around here. Scrum focuses on it. It's just, you have a lot of tiny ones. And at the end, there's a review of the sprint. You demonstrate, you finish up the work. You do your retrospective and ask what happened, what can we do better? You plan it all over again. And you're constantly adjusting, but you have that sprint, that little micro project to focus on. Now though that got a little bit wordy, so are there any questions about Scrum before we see how our imaginary team deals with it? All right, thanks. Hi. Oh yes, I think I heard somebody. Sorry, I had a question, I was double muted. In the last um, kind of workflow, your last slide, where would um, the project manager fit in here, and sorry if that's a dumb question, but I know there's a product owner and then there's a scrum master. Does the scrum master act as a project manager or? Uh, well, first of all, some people here are already scrum practitioners are probably gonna, la that comes up a lot. And the answer is not always clear, to be honest. The scrum master is usually the closest thing to the project manager. But I usually find when you use Scrum, uh, the product owner and the Scrum master sort of split what we'd call traditional project manager duties. The product owner is much more looking at the work to do 
And the Scrum Master is focused on the process of doing the work, uh, solving problems and making sure things move forward. The usual default in practice is the Scrum Master is the closest thing. But these duties don't always map one to one. And having said that, uh, Brendan, Sabrina, or anyone else, would you like to have a very public argument with me? <laughs> just, just that in training, we were told, and it doesn't happen here at Stanford, but the idea that the project manager could be part of the actual Scrum team mm -hmm. and that you would integrate that role. The Scrum teams I deal with, they all just really can team developers, as well as the product owners, no project managers, no testers, but different organizations outside of Stanford, I know, run teams with things like developers, testers, tech writers, project managers, all part of their team. Yeah. Some Scrum, I should note that even in technology, sometimes the Scrum team is not just engineers, as Brendan notes. Uh, I said in the practice I'm used to, the Scrum master is usually the closest thing, but it will vary. Uh, Agile is not a checklist. Agile, and all, there are very few Agile methods. They're perfect, you must checklists. And if they are, people ignore those half the time anyway. I hope that answers your question. From my experience- and oh, Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry. We, we don't do this here at Stanford, but in my previous role, we worked with a technical project manager who filled the role of both the scrum master and who interfaced closely with the product owner to groom the backlog and keep the projects on track. We only have one such person here and he works under Aditya's group, but we have been in talks with Maya to potentially um, bring in additional technical project manager resources in the future. Thank you for sharing that, Sabrina. You can see how we vary this. But because our time is limited, I'm going to move on. Oh, hi. Oh, yeah, sorry. Stephen, this is Terry. If I could ask a question about mm -hmm. the product owner. There seems to be differences of opinion as to whether that person lives on the user slash business side of the house or on the IT side of the house. Mm -hmm. What's the norm and what's your opinion? I honestly haven't experienced a norm. I've experienced everything from on the team to the business side to almost an independent person. So, so uh, I don't hi, have Teddy. a norm. It's Nev here. Uh, I have experienced both within Stanford. When I joined Stanford, I joined as a product owner from the business side, working closely with the research I, uh, at then called as I, IRT team. And now I am, for one of my projects, I'm a product owner from an IT site, working with the IT team. So it totally depends upon the project. In fact, I would add, because I do need to move on due to time, that's another thing that embodies Agile's people-centric approach. You tweak the methods, you figure what works for you. These ideas are meant to be hacked. It's almost like open source. But as you've seen here, Scrum empowers people. It's about communication. Everyone is touching base. And like us, you can even discuss the exact role designations. There's short phases for feedback. Backlogs are collaborative. The product owner may own it, but the team has a say in what they can take. The process and tools are light. It may be meeting heavy, but I've seen advanced companies literally run this off of sticky notes. And changes worked into the method. You literally rethink everything at the end of a sprint, sometimes during. Let's see how this team, Project Apis's team, reacts. Ruth, the analyst, likes how change is baked in and it's very transparent. She won't miss things and it's honest. Sai likes the fact that he's got a plan that's also not a plan. There's one board for statuses, so he's not filling anything out. And he's going to be less of a middleman. Kel likes the fact that they're going to pace themselves, collaborate, and that the engineers are actually going to get paid attention to for a change. And Scrum really does show agile and powers. It's very team oriented. The distinct roles just provide clarity. It's honest, it's transparent, that builds trust. You can't avoid problems or each other. And it's collaborative. Everyone is on board solving things. And it's an easy framework. Uh, my experience when I was an old school waterfall project manager, the idea of being able to do stuff with sticky notes absolutely blew my mind. 
I ran my first Agile project out of Excel, which is clearly something we would never do here using Excel for everything. So I want to hear really quickly from the audience, uh, is there anybody that has a, that is new to Scrum and sees something they think is really cool? Anyone? Okay, we'll throw the poll up at the end to get a little more feedback. Steve? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, um, how would you handle this? Uh, I think in many of our situations, getting those people to do a stand-up every day is just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Are your, what are your thoughts on that? Is that just means that that team's not ready to adopt this process or are there ways to work around that? Uh, no, my first introduction to Agile was actually a team that had the same problem and they just figured how many days can we do it a week and they settled on three. So you see what else you can do. It is important to have some kind of check-in, but I've seen teams reduce it to three days a week. Sometimes it's a two in-person check-ins and three Slack check-ins. It, what, it's what you're able to deal with. So you find some way to make sure you're always in touch as face-to-face -face or video as possible. But there are also some other methods that might fit you if you think that's too much of a blocker. I hope that helps out. Yes, thank you. Yeah. In fact, when I, I was first reluctant when I was taught Scrum, and uh, when the person mentioned that was their hack, it impressed me that they were actually adapting. But now let's move on here. So let's get going. The team chooses their roles. Ruth, the product analyst, becomes the product owner. It's pretty close to what she was doing anyway. And she knows everyone. Size, the Scrum master. He's been running all the planning sessions anyway. And of course, He's the kind of guy to read up on everything. He's already dived into it. And now he doesn't have to do status reports. For Kel, her job doesn't change too much and she has less responsibilities. And she thinks she can get back to some programming now. But you need a backlog and you have to have that huge list of things. Now, normally the product owner could make one, but you've already got a project where a lot's happened and a lot of people are involved. And you gotta get that team used to working together. Sai's already got an idea. He's heard about a technique called sprint zero. And one of the great things about agile approaches is there's sort of toolkits and ideas and floating ideas of how to make it work. Sprint zero is kind of a extension of scrum where you get the whole team together to actually uh, discuss how to do all the work. You throw everyone into a room and I've seen projects with 50 people spending two weeks of meetings together on a huge project. The idea is to get everyone involved. It's not a plan. You just figure out enough of a backlog with the product owner, the end users, the engineers, the trainers, whoever, to get enough of a backlog to do the work. And you do it together. You collaborate. And it's a good way to kick off teams as well. I've seen them done in a day. And as I said, I've seen huge projects where it was two weeks of people having six hours of meetings a day. Now, Ruth here, decided she should handle this. She knows everyone, but she's going to stay out of the way. She wants people to talk to each other. She wants the engineers and the end users to communicate. She'll work on getting that backlog, but this is a chance for everyone to get to know each other and cooperate. So that's also a good example. You can find little hacks to all sorts of agile methods. So just a moment. So I'm going to talk planning. I'm going to hurry it up just a tad. So the sprint started. How did the team APIS planning go? Well, Ruth found that the end users and she had to answer a lot of questions. Now that they're talking to the engineers, they're realizing what it's like to implement this project. And they had to change their priorities. Some things can't be done in the order they wanted. But also she noticed something, the end users talking to the engineers and coming actually into planning and going to the sprint zero, they get the big picture now. For Sai, well, it took a long time to do planning. People grumbled, but they got questions answered. You get together when you do the planning and that's the product owner, the team, the scrum master, and sometimes some end users, you'll actually talk and you'll solve problems before they come up. And he's got ideas to go faster. Kel is a little surprised it took four hours for their first planning session. 
But now that they've talked it out, her team has a workload that they can manage. And she realizes they're doing what people want done. Her only concern is she hopes she gets a free lunch next time. By the way, if you do large planning sessions, the free lunch thing is a consideration, not that I'm biased. Agile planning is cooperative. When the team goes in and does their planning for their first sprint, everyone plans together, everyone talks because everyone knows something. You don't know what your team knows until they get there and get it out and they have to feel free to speak. And you wanna also be inclusive. You never know when someone has something to contribute. Ruth may own the product backlog, but she sees the product as belonging to everyone. And she invited the training lead to the meeting, which surprised Kel, the lead programmer. But the training person showed how a slight schedule change, getting some work done in a different order, let the training videos for Project APIS get done earlier. So when you're doing sprint planning, you might wanna overdo inviting people and getting feedback because people like the engineers, the engineers know a lot, the documentation team, the deployment team, they all know something. And maybe you want them in on this. You might be surprised who knows things. So any questions on planning a sprint out? I'm sure there's at least one person that's made training documentation that would love to be included more. Let's take the look at the day by day of Scrum. As we said, the teams check in every day. And Ruth, day to day, her whole job is human contact. The team comes to her with questions. The engineers ping her on Slack and ask, what's going on? How do I get this answered? She may attend the daily standups and should to answer questions. And she has to go to the end users all the time. Her job is almost, exact, almost constantly talking to people. And she's glad though she could offload a few duties. Sai likes the predictability. Every day there's a standup and everyone's keeping in touch. They're not keeping in touch through his reports, they're keeping in touch through talking. But he's also finding his scrum master, the job of a scrum master is to troubleshoot problems so the team can focus. He's always running around trying to find out something like what delayed this launch? How do we get this cloud computing provisioned? But it also means he's learning. Every day the team asks for some help he can solve, he's better able to help them perform better. And Kel can focus and the touch bases bring feedback. And sometimes the end users come in and talk and they can actually show their progress and they're getting ideas of what the end users really want. Plus, they can toss problems to Sai and Ruth. The scrum master and the product owner help solve problems. Sai solves things that are blocking the team. Ruth helps answer questions about the product. The engineers aren't getting distracted anymore. They can focus because they know who has their back. Hey, Steve? Yes. Um, it's Lisa. Um, I'm just wondering if for the non-TDS audience, if um, as you're talking about this, I, I don't know if you are able to frame it with an actual example in mind because I'm I'm thinking about like when Helen Wilmot used to talk about they use Scrum in the planning of um, the construction of 500P and I'm just oh. trying to wrap my brain around oh, okay. like that would you know that was a multi-year of course pro process but it seemed like the Scrum was a discrete activity within that multi-year. And, and so, uh, process and 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 I and I just might help connect the dots for the less familiar um, with agile uh, participants on this talk. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, and that's also a good example that sometimes Scrum exists inside a larger plan and process or any agile method. Uh, to give you a, a concrete example um, that I just had is one of my standups today. My teams were getting familiar with an application they moved to. So what we did was everyone decided to design part of it. That way they would get familiar with the technology and with the interface. We go into the meeting, we discuss what we did, what we're going to do, but also everyone presents on feedback. Did I get this design right? Do I understand this thing we're taking over? And as Scrum Master, I barely had to do anything, but the team got feedback from a person that knew about the application. And this transition was made easier by deciding 
We need to try something out to get ready. We need feedback and demonstrating as we went. Now at the end, there'll be a full demonstration tomorrow. But having those check-ins made sure people could navigate and do the right thing. Is that a good example, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to kind of shift gears and think about like, I know there's a team, maybe people on this call involved in a new um, uh, physician onboarding product that mm. folks in academic affiliations will be using um, as they're onboarding new faculty. And, and, I'm, and I'm just thinking, boy, they're not, I don't think they're touching, they're, they're talking to people in academic affairs on a daily basis. It's more infrequent than that. Sometimes, on, and sometimes that's hard. That's why the product owner is important. They can be a bridge. It's good to have feedback from the end user as much as possible, but the product owner is the person that connects it all up. And sometimes you can't, though you should have the right people or at least as many as possible for your demonstrations. And that's, but it is hard to get people sometimes and you have to adapt. But if those people have any questions, I'm sure you can send it our way and the Agile growth team, me, Brendan, Mike, Anil, all the rest, Nivi, one of my coworkers, I'm sure we have plenty of opinions. So as we noted, people communicate regularly and Scrum is formal about communications, but all Agile methods encourage communications. And you need to coach people to support communicating. Some of us aren't used to it. Lisa, in fact, gave a great example. Sometimes it's hard to engage people. But Sai here, as usual, has been doing research. And he has an idea of ways to improve communications. And Lisa, it's almost like uh, you led into this, but you have never seen this presentation before, right? It's like a stage magician. Here's some tweaks that I've seen used over my way too many years in IT. Use it where you repurpose an existing meeting. So maybe you're, you wanna demonstrate some items, but it's hard to get people around. But if you can run small demos at a standup, get the customer in, that's a good idea. War rooms and swarming, this is a personal favorite. If you have a big problem, you have an open room or an open Zoom, everyone gets in everyone possible, engineers, product owners, scrum master, end user, and you just sit on the line while everyone collaborates to solve problems. I had a project um, I was brought on to that was in crisis, and we had a lot of trouble getting things to work. So I'm like, send us a meeting room. We set up a room, threw on a conference line, and people sat in that room four to six hours a day to get through this prototype. Another method is open hours. Maybe you have an important end user that you need to talk to, but oh, their schedule's unpredictable. But maybe they agree to be always available at 1 p.m. on a Wednesday. And you can always find them. That's another classic agile hack. Another one is open space. Um, you can have something where there's a meeting that's just thrown open outside of your standups and anyone just sign on and see what's going on and check in. Finally, try to use chats and email. I know emails are confusing and we feel spammed. I know that we all have a bunch of Slack or Teams channels, but with the right protocols, sometimes you can remove that need for direct contact. I like to talk one-on-one, -on -one, but sometimes you just can't do it. But these are some tweaks that you can use in Agile. And these are techniques that I've seen used over and over again. And again, because any Agile method, you should hack it. You should try to figure out ways to optimize it. On another project, the team were practically inventing a separate method. But I'm going to move on here. So the end of the sprint, Project Apis gets to the end of their first sprint. What's going on? Well, let's see what it's like. Ruth, the product owner, they had six hours of demonstrations, retrospectives, and planning. They made an event of it, but getting through their first sprint was six hours of work. These things can take a while to happen. So if you move to something like Scrum or even other methods, it can be a bumpy road for a while. Sai, no, he's thrilled. They got 80% of the work they wanted done. And they were able to warn people about what wasn't going to get done. And he held a retrospective, a review of what happened. And everyone was honest about what went on and they figured out what they can do better. 
Kel thinks it's going to take some time for engineers to get used to having a few big meetings. But at the end, the users actually see why things didn't get done. And because they had all that feedback, they didn't just plan out the next sprint, they planned out an extra week ahead. The end of sprints can take time and it takes a while to adjust, but you get feedback, you learn why, you talk, you plan together. And that, that's a good example of how a good first sprint can run. Because the end of sprint is everyone. You gather, you demonstrate, you share your learnings, you adjust your plans. And because everyone is working together, past and future goals become realistic and sustainable. You realize, eh, maybe this last thing was as good as we can do. You realize how much you can do next. And Cal is already thinking that besides this method of Scrum, there's others. So she's building a library of Agile books. Because once you start using one Agile technique, you'll want to learn about others to find what fits. Now, I'd like to go to the end of the project, but are there any questions before we reveal how it all went? OK. I want you to think about how you define success. Is it getting everything you plan done, getting something that works, getting something everyone agrees on is good enough, surviving, or do you just refuse to discuss what a success is or the grounds that will incriminate you? I would like to hear from anybody who would like to talk about their definition of success, except for the last one, you don't have to say who you are. Does anyone like to describe what they think success really is? Or are we all in the last category? Dot, I see you smiling there. I'm going to call on you, Dot. What's your definition of success? Myself. Um, so yes, no, I am laughing because um, I I feel like um, deliverables are definitely important, but I feel like the way that we go about those deliverables is just as important. So if we meet a goal, but everybody feels like they weren't necessarily, you know, they just feel like the process wasn't well, they're stressed, they don't feel appreciated, then to me, that's not successful. Um, so. Yeah, so really uh, it's, you believe in getting something everyone agrees on is good enough. The thing is getting there, but not burning people out and, you know, not just following a list of things. Correct. Well, thank you for that contribution and for your quickly diving in on when I called on you. Yeah. Brendan and Nivy can tell you I love to do that sometime. But so let's ask how Project Apis really went. Now, this is a good team, but how did it go for them? Well, Ruth says they didn't get all the features they wanted, but they got the application out partially three months early so they could actually start using it. And there's about 10 to 20 percent not done but she's not sure they actually needed that. A lot of Agile is doing the most important thing first, the most valuable. You don't expect to get everything done. You expect to do the important stuff. Size thrilled. Yes, there were challenges and problems, but they just reprioritized. And when he launched things early, he got a lot of feedback and avoided issues. He's happy because the project adapted. And Cal is happy that the team isn't burnt out, they slowed down, they got more out early, and there's no bad feelings now. Sure, they didn't get everything they wanted, but Project APIS, the big mentoring program, got enough done to start using it early and got enough done to make it useful. And everyone's getting along and a lot happier. Success in Agile is delivering as much valuable as possible in the best way. You want to deliver early so you can work together and get something basic out. That also means you get feedback. Sometimes agile teams actually just spend a sprint or two making a prototype and building off of that. You do what matters. You focus on what brings the most value and the most valuable work is done early. Doing it all is not the goal because you can endlessly come up with new things to do. It's finding what matters. It's sustainable through realistic goals. The team doesn't overwork themselves. And as we all know, a team that's not overworking themselves in the end does more. But it's also cohesion. Agile methods are about building relationships and the group you work with will get better and better at delivering over time. 
And even if that team breaks up and goes elsewhere, everyone's going to carry the lessons with them. A classic method of becoming more agile is actually having a seed team get really good at it than spreading the word. But success is getting value to people early the best way. But any questions about success? Because now we're going to do some follow up on this team. I'm not going to call on anyone, don't worry. So what Ruth wants to do, she wants to develop. Now, Ruth's a communication person. She knows everyone, but she knows that you got to communicate to use Agile. And she realizes now how much she took her own communication skills for granted. She's also going to be pitching ideas to other people. And of course, Sai is, as usual, reading everything. What Ruth is going to focus on are these things, story creation. How do you write better stories, better pieces of work to do? She's think, also, yes. If I can interrupt that. I don't, I think a lot of people don't know what creating backlogs means because oh. that's, you know, something very not desirable ah. in healthcare. Well, a backlog is kind of like your project plan. It's the list of everything you want to accomplish. It's just in order of importance. So the idea is that's composed of stories, individual pieces of work described enough for the team to use them. You break things down into a fine-grained enough set of things to do, put in the order of value that you want to see, and you start taking the most important items first. I like to note when people want a plan that the backlog kind of is the plan. It's the order you think you should do things in, but it will change, but it changes through communication and reveal. I hope that answers your questions. Yes, thanks. Yeah. There's also different Agile frameworks. We just talk Scrum, but there are other methods out there. And there are people that have these advanced versions of frameworks. There are entire books discussing how to break work down out there. You can go to O'Reilly and waste a lot of money getting them. There's also writing though. People that have to write a lot in these teams, these Agile teams, they may actually wanna take a course or some training on business communication. Speaking is important. As you can tell, I love to speak. I actually don't just speak here. I speak at various events on self-publishing and productivity. I use that to hone my abilities. What I do in my hobbies helps my job and vice versa. And finally, you might want to learn about graphics. A wireframe is worth a thousand words and two two-hour discussions. A good infographic can explain why something is important where otherwise you need pages of text. People should learn how to do good graphical communication on a project as well. So that's very important is all the team members should learn how to communicate. I would say the product owner is the person that it should be the most expert, but everyone should learn. And if you're a communication type person and like that a lot, if you like Agile, maybe product owner or similar role is going to fit you. Sai's goal is to look at other methods. He wants to learn more after trying Scrum, and he wants to coach people to be better. And he's decided to look at another Agile method called Kanban. I'm going to talk about it really quick because Kanban, and Stephanie, you've used this, right? I believe I heard you say that? Yes. Yes. So... If you have any opinions, chime in. Kanban's another Agile method, but it's very flow-based. In short form, you still have a backlog, a queue, of work in order of importance. You send it through, you send it through sort of a series of gates, of stages of the work. So you see where important things are. But that flow helps you find blockages when things pile up when things aren't being done. It sees where you have space to work. Uh, the classic method, as I hear, is always pull is you don't ask what you take next. You ask where you have space. Is it time to do you have space and deploy, space and testing? You pull work in. And you often set limits on your work, such as only so many stories in flight or how many sto so many stories in each stage of work to kind of squeeze yourself a bit and look for blockages. Kanban is very flow-based. It's looking at how work is flowing through the system. But that also means you see blockages. 
And this board becomes both your backlog and your status report, and anybody can look at it to see where things are. I didn't used to like Kanban, but I've been using it more. And I'm very fond of the fact it gives you an idea of where your workflow is and very quickly finds problems. A, uh, an old mentor of mine used to jokingly say, Kanban isn't a project management tool, it's just a tool to find out what's wrong. I can't argue with him. Sabrina, do you have anything to add on your Kanban experiences? Uh, from from our perspective, the, the Kanban project under my umbrella is uh, the one where we build departmental sites for, for SharePoint under our mm -hmm. SHC Connect product. Um, and because everything has to undergo user acceptance testing and feedback, and that occurs on their own schedule, we never really know when we're going to get that time from them. So we treat that project as a Kanban just because it gives us the ability to freely move things in, things in and out of sprints as they emerge. I like that idea of using it to manage end resource goals too. Thanks. That's actually something I hadn't considered of a way to manage an area of uh, basically, basically like that before. So that's just an example of an ad, another agile method and there's plenty. And if you get really into agile, don't stay with one method, study up on them. You'll learn a lot. However, speaking of learning a lot, Kel's thinking big. She's a lead programmer and it's been a long time. She wants to be an architect. And she starts thinking about, wait, is there a way to make Agile bigger? I, I was on one team. What if you have to coordinate several teams? And there's something referred to as scaled Agile, uh, making Agile bigger. And one method she's looking at is called Scrum at Scale because you don't have to just use Agile methods on one team. You could use Agile methods on large projects, entire companies. The idea of Scrum of Scrums is you actually have several teams, just like Kel's team. And they don't just check in uh, every day. The Scrum masters from each team check in in what's called a Scrum of Scrums. And if you've got a larger project, you just stack the Scrum of Scrums teams and you have the Scrum of Scrum of Scrums. You literally just stack Scrum teams on top of each other. Each level is just Scrum masters reporting up one more level. So there's a scrum master, a scrum of scrum masters. And this goes all the way to the EAT team, the exit of action team that makes sure they maintain standards and solves problems for the whole team, the whole group. This is an example of solving a larger problem very quickly with agile methods. And I've used this a little bit myself. And you also have many product owners that deal with a product owner above them. You break the work up and every team above reflects the team below. But the goal is to meet, solve problems together. And if there's nothing you can solve, it goes all the way to the top. And Kel is already thinking, this is what she wants to do when she's an architect. And we'll, I have some resources at the end of this presentation when it goes out that'll help you see three different methods for scaling Agile. So having, my next question is what interests you about Agile right now? I wanna hear someone that hasn't used Agile. What makes you curious about this? Somebody chime on in, don't be afraid. I'm not gonna make you implement it. Hey Steve, this is Lane. I'm just gonna play timekeeper here. Oh, I'm about we done know, anyway. We, need, we usually try to wrap up by 12.50, so we, in the next couple of minutes can wrap up that be great. All right, we'll tell you what, I will. So just a quick review. Agile is about empowering teams. It's a philosophy of ideal projects that are people and communication centered. There are methods to put it into practice. It's where you really are and where other people are. It's realistic. So thanks for your time. What's next? You can contact me if you have any questions uh, and I'll relay you to the team. We have a bunch of Agilists that can give you ideas. Go get yourself an Agile certification somewhere. I'll point you in the right direction. And we do have a reading list because at the end, there is an appendix which a bunch of resources for you to use. This is gonna go out when Selena mails it. And you can go here, ask me, ask Brendan, ask some of our other Agilists. But as noted, we're kind of at time. So I'm gonna run a quick poll. You can all fill in, give your opinions on the questions. And we're open for a little bit of chatting. So what, what do people want to ask? And I've got some of my fellow Agilists here. We'll see what we can do. 
there any questions? So uh, uh, Jeremy put something in there, a longer question, but what would you say is the difference between agile and lean? Brendan, you know that I just call that a source of arguments. Uh, I've, I've been forced that I, I have an opinion on this that's very strong. I view lean as process, agile as project. They come from similar origins. I believe lean can be contained within agile or operate on its own. And yes, I've watched grown adults have arguments over this, so I try to stay out of them. You knew the answer, Brendan. <laughs> what is your opinion? We can fight over it in public. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I, I like what Jeremy put in there. He put a longer comment in there explaining, you know, where the origins of his questions come from. So, Jeremy, thank you for that question. And, you know, once again, it's, it's such a tailored uh, approach. I've worked with several different Scrum teams, and they've all done Agile Scrum differently. Every single one has done it differently to different degrees. And that allows for that lean operation. So I think Agile supports a lean philosophy, but I like how it works the best. The funny thing about Agile and lean is they actually come from very similar origins. Um, and I think that's why sometimes they get lumped together. And then sometimes why I'm at an Agile conference wishing people wouldn't argue over it. But yeah, it's worth, by the way, I do strongly recommend studying both because we do use lean at SHC and it has some excellent ways of explaining productivity. Really good, really good material. So let me check our poll here and see how people are bearing their souls. Um, if anyone can chime in, I don't know if anyone's answered the poll yet. Um, I'm not sure anyone is getting the uh, poll, Selena. It was up uh, for a couple seconds and then it disappeared. It uh, dropped off the screen. Uh, uh, Brendan, do you want to complain about Zoom or can I? You know me, I have a love affair with Zoom, so I, oh, there it is. Thank you so much. I don't judge you, Brendan, not in public at any rate. Uh, I still remember the WebEx days. So are there any other questions? We've still got about six minutes here, and I'm sure we'd all like to help you out. Yes, yeah, Steve, I'll ask a question. Um, Jake. I, the, the part that I found most interesting about this is this backlog. Mm -hmm. um, and the and the fact that it's an ordered backlog. Mm -hmm. Have you seen? Is it varied the way that people order that backlog, or is there actually some some science they use behind that? Technically, you should order it in order of importance of value that the end user wants. However, usually once you start reviewing it, that does change. Some things aren't possible. Some things have to be done. You discover new value. You break things up. The thing I used to say about the backlog is by forcing the order of importance, it makes you ask questions and break things down. You ask what's important. Someone wants a, someone wants a new web interface, but you can't do that till you spin up a new server. So do you build a prototype or do you spin up the new server first? The backlog helps you decide what to do, but also forces the question of what's important to do next. The thing I like about Scrum is you're not just doing it in order, you're taking a block of work and it's a little easy to work around dependencies like that. But think of the backlog as a, a way to get a view of what's important, but then have a continuing conversation about it. Because if anyone, I, Nivi in fact is an exceptional product owner and I'm sure she can tell you many times the order has been challenged by painful reality. I hope that helps. Looking to be a product owner, Jake? I, then I, I'm not going to answer that, but sure, I, I do find this interesting and the process is, is helpful to see. If you contact me and I'll hook you up with the rest of the gang. And I said, I work with Brendan, Nivy, and Neil, all these people here. We're always glad to um, add, in, you know, add ideas and help you out. That's the thing we have to do at TDS at Stanford. Everything is all hands on deck. We should help each other out. That's agile too. So I got four minutes, and as everyone knows, I will talk, but a few interesting things is, it looks like a lot of people on agile strength, they think they're real collaborators and communicators. It's good to hear. Uh, most interest in Scrum is people like the idea of short sprints with deliverables. 
I am sensing a lot of us love the idea of having a project made of tiny other projects. And as a former waterfall guy, I love that too. Um, absolutely no one has said they refuse to define success on the grounds that may incriminate them. But we have a tie that success is getting something that works done versus getting something everyone agrees on is good enough. And what's really interested for people is a lot of you are interested in ways to improve your current process, followed by ways to do projects. So I'm going to just share this poll here, and I want you to all think that over about you know, what you're good at and how you can help each other out. Because you have all these tools, and no matter what I say, it's all about you and how you actually. I'm just here to help you out. So we're almost done. Any more questions before we, we all inevitably get back to work? And Jake looks at product owner training. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you, Brendan, for chiming in. And I, Brendan helped me plan this and then I had to take it because of jury duty. And I would also like to thank the imaginary team that we uh, had, Cy, Ruth, Kel, in no way they're based on people I know and in no way is Cy a younger version of me. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Jake and Dot, for being willing to face some jokes and be called on. And look for the recording and the presentation. Take care and congratulations to Celine and Lisa, our first SMCI multi-group crossover. And uh, thank you, Stephen, for those um, in, the, in the chat. If you want to join SMCI, you can just go to smci.stanford.edu and click on the engage. And we'd love to have all of you join us. Thanks very much. Have a great and, rest of the day. And if you're in the hospital, join. SMCI wants to make things run better. It's a great group, and I'm glad I found it. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.